Well, Dio, let's kick off. Thank you, everybody. You joined on time. Uh, welcome to SAFMED Education's Digital Courses, of course, our webinar today. Today, we're talking about safety for all, safety for the patients, safety for the healthcare team in the operating room and the CSSD. This is webinar two in our series. The webinar is, of course, brought to you by uh, SAFMED. SAFMED is your solutions partner in both the CSSD and the operating room and has been so for over 35 years. Thank you once again, SAFMED. Just as a reminder, uh, for if anybody is new to our webinars, we have a, a whole bank of webinar recordings available on SAFMED's YouTube channel. We've had over 7,000 7, uh, views on those webinar recordings. There are a number of different series focusing on effective cleaning, rigid endoscopes, track trace and instrument management, uh, maintaining sterility, cleaning chemistries, really in-depth, in-depth series on sterile barrier systems, teach you how we make them, how we test them. Uh, so if you'd like any links, uh, links for those recordings as well as the post-webinar test, please feel free to email me. Right, so what are we talking about today? As we said, we're talking about safety. We're talking about safety in the operating room and we're talking about safety in the CSSD environment. And we're going to look at it from both perspectives, from the perspective of the patient and the perspective of, of us, the healthcare worker. If you want to talk about safety, of course, it's very important to first start by understanding what the hazards are. And um, I came across this really, really interesting handbook of occupational hazards and controls. In fact, this particular one focused on um, CSSD, but of course, this is relevant to, uh, to all of us in the operating room and the CSSD environment. So what are the hazards in the operating room and the CSSD for us, for the healthcare worker? Well, they can be divided into different categories. We can look at them from chemical, biologic, biological, ergonomic, physical, or psychological um, hazards. When it comes to chemical, examples could include things like high-level disinfectants, bone cement, sterilizing agents, maybe even cleaning agents for some people could be a hazard. Uh, biological uh, things, what of course includes pathogenic microorganisms, which we are exposed to every day in absolutely almost everything we do in the field. Ergonomic issues relating to standing, pushing, pulling, lifting, lifting being in awkward positions and bad lighting. Physical things, of course, can include slips, trips, falls, sharps, burns, noise, electrical issues, surgical plume and fire. And there's also the psychological hazards, including abuse, techno stress, impact of aging and shift work. All of these are potential hazards for all of us working in this environment. So looking at the same categories, what about the patients? Of course, the patient is also at risk um, and the hazards include uh, high level disinfectants, for example, bone cement uh, cleaning solutions, or in fact, not using cleaning solutions correctly, are all a hazard for the patient. Patient is of course exposed or potentially exposed to pathogenic microorganisms, again, especially if we don't do our job correctly in terms of um, hand washing and uh, cleaning the environment and decontaminating the devices that we use. Ergonomically, of course, if we position the patient poorly, um, however we, we manage the patient, there is the potential for the patient to develop pressure injuries as well, as, long, as well as uh, neurological issues, muscular disorders, etc. Physical, uh, patient could fall, could get burnt, is exposed to noise, is exposed to electricity, uh, potential for fire, or another, of course, horrible potential hazard is retained surgical item. Um, psychologically, going for surgery, of course, is very stressful. It's a really cold, noisy, difficult environment, bright lights, narrow tables, awkward, awkward environment for the patient. So let's delve into some of these details. Of course, we covered uh, chemical, biological hazards and some of the economic issues in uh, in webinar one. So uh, yes, apologies, we haven't sent out the link to the recording and the test yet for webinar one, but we will do so as soon as we are able to. Okay, 
um, interesting uh, book released by the American College of Surgeons, and it talks about surgical ergonomics. And um, in this particular uh, section, it refers to improper lighting. So it talks about both improper lighting and display. So, of course, display orientation when it comes to monitors, etc., when you are working with um, endoscopic or mineral invasive surgery. Um, all of these can have a terrible, it can have an adverse effect on the performance of the surgeon. It can also cause eye strain as well as muscular musculoskeletal fatigue, all of which is a great issue for all of us, not just the surgeon. Um, the guidelines from the American College of Surgeons go on to state that it's very important to ensure that the open surgical field, so an open surgery, has high luminous, so good strong light, um, and the importance of using two or more operating lights at different angles. Uh, logical to place the overhead lights between the surgeon and the assistant in most cases, because that's what's going to give you the best view. Avoid creating shadows from a single light source, or of course, we know that the surgeon or the assistant's head can also be in the way, which is why, again, having two light heads makes us manage those, those particular potential issues. And very important, and I don't think we do this or we all do this, is that is for laparoscopic surgery. Important to ensure that the room lights are dimmed to reduce glare and contrast. That'll help from a fatigue point of view at the end of the day. So some of us have a, um, a, a job that requires being seated at a desk for periods of time or sometimes for very long periods of time. And sitting at a desk also has ergonomical potential issues. And uh, uh, this particular guideline reminds us of the fact that it's very, very important, for example, to keep your wrist in a neutral position when you're at the desk. At the desk. You can see the image on the right um, uh, where the lady who is, is seated incorrectly um, at the top and then positioned better um, in, the, in the bottom image. So now what we're going to do is take a look at this little video. The video is about two and a half, three minutes long. So depending on your internet feed, depending on, um, on your circumstances, you may or may not see this video. If you have any issues seeing the video, please don't stress. Hang on for us for about three minutes uh, and we'll carry on with the slides again. In the recorded version, you will definitely be able to see the video. This talks about how to, how to set up the ergonomics, how to set up your positioning correctly when seated at your desk. Um, if you Here's your desk. Your chair, monitor, keyboard, mouse, phone, a plant? Sure. Problem is, your desk isn't really built for you. It's for anyone. Spending eight hours a day reaching, slouching, or craning can lead to pain. At least that's what John Sinke from the Hospital for Special Surgery says. I do say that every day. So he's here to, well, he can tell you. I'm here to show you how to set up your desk ergonomically so you can avoid pain later on in life. Step one, adjust your chair. The average desk height is 29 to 30 inches tall. For some, this could be too tall or too short. That's where your chair comes in. The first thing you want to do is adjust the height. When you do, make sure your elbows are bent to 90 degrees. So if a person's feet are not touching the floor, this could become an issue. So we're going to give her a footstool. If you don't have access to a footrest, we recommend using a ream of paper. Step two is adjust your monitor. The tip is to have the monitor close enough about arm's length so you're able to read without having to strain your eyes or to bend forward and adjust your posture. So what you want to do is raise the monitor up till the top of the screen is eye level. If your monitor is not adjustable in height, use your reams of paper. Much better. If you work from two monitors, consider how you use them. If you have a primary monitor, you want that directly in front of you. If you use both monitors equally, you want them lined up so you are in the middle of the two. For a laptop, you want to use a kickstand to raise the screen up to the proper height. Then you can attach an external keyboard and mouse to it. Step number three is to mind your mouse and your keyboard. Where your hands end up is where your keyboard should be. Your mouse should end up right next to your keyboard. You want to move from your elbow instead of your shoulder to prevent overuse or strain or pain. The key is not to reach for your tools. Step four is to position your phone. 
you want to put the phone on your non-riding side so you don't have to cradle it to your shoulder. This could eventually lead to neck pain. If you're on the phone a good portion of your day, you want to consider using a headset. That way your hands are free to write down anything or to type on the computer. Step 5. Move. After 10-15 minutes, we all begin to slouch in our chairs. So here are some basic exercises you can do while sitting in your chair. The first exercise is a chin tuck. The second exercise is for your upper traps. You're going to do a basic stretch where you bend your head to one side and then gently pull for a little more oomph. The third exercise is called a scapular retraction. You basically are going to squeeze your shoulders back. The fourth exercise is for your lower back. This is what we call a pelvic tilt. The most important thing you want to do is get up out of your chair every hour. Get up and walk. Get something to eat. Get something to drink. Just get up. John? John, are we done? Yeah, we're good. Great. Currently seated at a desk, you'll find yourself trying to manipulate the chair and, and move everything around almost immediately. Let's have a look at these guidelines. Alrighty, so I hope you've adjusted your chair and your desk and you took note of all of that so that you can get nice and comfortable and prevent any injuries while seated at your desk. Right, so we're going to move on now and talk about some physical issues and some physical hazards that we come across. First, I want to look at this published paper. So this was published in the World, of, World Journal of Surgery in 2019, and it talks about surgical adverse events, um, and this is from a, a, a South African setting. Surgical never events have a serious adverse outcome for a patient. And a never event is defined as a serious, avoidable patient incident or patient safety incident that would not have occurred if the necessary preventive measures had been implemented. So in this paper, they did a retrospective review over a five year period from 2012 to 2017 in the Peter Maritzburg Metropolitan Surgical Service area. And in that time, over 2,000 patients had been admitted, 7,187 morbidities had occurred, 79 near events were identified, and 126 near misses were also identified in that time frame. So if we just have a look at the never events, so the never events were severe adverse things that happened that could have been prevented. They included pressure sores, drug related things, uh, fire and burns, wrong procedure, wrong patient or wrong side, um, loss of specimen, retained surgical instrument or swab, incidence of fall, fictitious vitals where somebody's written down the wrong stuff that wasn't real and resulted in an adverse event for the patient, loss of an intravascular device um, and a transfusion reaction, total of 79. So let's just talk about those in a bit more detail. Three patients all in pediatric surgery in these incidents underwent bilateral inguinal hernia uh, repairs but actually only had uni unilateral hernias. Um, three of the fire incidents resulted to, um, to the dithermy use um, near and completely dyed chlor and dried chlorohexidine uh, patient cleaning solutions, which I'm sure you are familiar with. So I've certainly had at least three or four of those incidents that I've managed both as a scrub person and being uh, whilst I was a theatre matron. They weren't fun. Um, they're quite scary. Sometimes you can't even see the flame and you can only smell the patient burning. Um, normally the hair burns first, of course. Um, I've had incidents with surgeons that were really impatient and, and wouldn't give us time to do our job and we ended up with issues like that. Um, I have even initiated a, a prank on a surgeon, but really on purpose where we put a fire extinguisher in, in the operating room on the desk area where he normally wrote his notes as a, to serve as a reminder of the importance of giving us time to do our jobs. Um, uh, of those burn in, uh, incidents, another three of them were because the dithermy point wasn't protected and it was activated at the wrong time and the patient was injured. Then there were a whole list of near misses in this, uh, in this scenario, including pressure sores, wrong patient related issues, uh, falls or jumps and wrong procedures. Really and truly quite sad, but these do occur. 
I spoke about noise being an issue um, in in the uh, in our environment, and of course, noise or sound is always measured in decibels. And in this published journal uh, uh, publication from the AORN Association of Operating Room Nurses in America, they talked to the fact that in the operating room, um, there's been an increase in um, noise levels by approximately 0.4 decibels per year in the last 30 years. And they've recorded noise peaks from things like powered orthopedic tools that can reach levels that actually exceed that of a jet plane um, flying over. And often the noisiest times during the surgical procedure are also uh, the critical phases of the procedure. They go on to list the critical phases, which of course would make good sense is during induction, um, during the surgical timeout, during any critical phase in the surgery itself, um, during our swab and instrument counts, when we're handling instruments and when we're waking up the patient. Those are all critical phases. Sources of noise and distraction will include technology like phones, music players and computers, electronic activities like emails, texts and games and weird things <laughs> that we shouldn't have happening, but they do. Um, patient care alarms, uh, patient monitors alarming, or pieces of equipment that are alarming. Behavioural things, which of course is talking, movement and traffic, people traffic. And mechanical things, HVAC, which of course is the air con, the clashing of metals and tools and bowls and surgical bits um, that are all and can be quite noisy. So in the recommendations from the ARN about dealing with noise, they say really and truly we should be following the same principle as we do with our, our pre-flight or our pre-surgical pre checklist, is that is prohibiting non-essential activities during the critical phases. And that means that we need to limit conversations and our voices, our volumes of our voices um, during the critical phases. We need to limit the amount of movement in and out of the room. And of course, you don't want to be nipping, nipping to the theatre next door just to check in with your mate as to what you were having for lunch and what you ordered and what happened last night during your socials or with your family. Please, we need to reduce that, limit that. And of course, when it comes to the HVAC, the air con, we need to make sure that our, our air cons are working correctly, not just for the infection prevention point of view, but also from a noise perspective. And also remove objects that could impede the airflow from the return vents. And we often cover them with all sorts of things, chairs, tables, desks, uh, bags, uh, you name it. We, we tend to cover those vents. Those vents are very important. Please don't block them. What about noise in the CSSD? Oh, there's a hell of a lot of noise in the CSSD, isn't there? We've got autoclaves that beep and bob and blink, and we've got washers that do their job. They tend to be a little bit quieter, thankfully. Um, but ultrasonics, so ultrasonics, you know, we've got the hissing noise in the ultrasonic bath, and that's audible, which is great because it actually indicates the presence of the cavitation, the bubble formation in the liquid, which we need. Hissing is often regarded as white noise. And also just to bear in mind, of course, the guidelines state that if you are exposed to um, to noise at over 85 decibels, then you should be wearing some form of uh, protective device. Nice to know that some of the makes and the models of the um, ultrasonic cleaners, what the decibels are, this particular one is at a maximum of 71 decibels, which is really um, great to know, so well within the, uh, the parameters. There was also a, an article published uh, in, in this particular journal. So this journal is known as Central Sterilization. It's from Germany. It's a, a journal that we follow very closely because it covers uh, really in-depth uh, publications relating to our CCSD matters. And in this particular journal, they looked at noise protection and the importance of this or its potential issues in our CCSD environments. Thankfully, the conclusions were that the measurements showed that the ultrasonic baths of normal sizes, so it's generally all the ones we use already in the South African setting, generally do not pose a hazard. The risk will increase, though, if you're running several units simultaneously. So a point to bear in mind, of course, if you're in a small contained environment, uh, noise can sometimes be a little worse. If you're in a bigger, bigger room, uh, the noise spreads a little bit. But of course, something to absorb sound also sometimes helps. 
already talking about fire. So there are three components that we need to ignite and sustain fire, and that is all listed here in our fire triangle, and that includes heat, fuel, and oxygen. Um, all of these are required. We need heat to, uh, to ignite, and we need some material to burn, um, and we need um, air uh, to be able to uh, to continue with this. Unfortunately, we have loads of all of these things available in our operating room. Um, you know, a fire source just waiting to happen. Uh, sources of heat and fuel in, in our environment include things like the diathermy, which we've spoken about already, fiber optic light guard cables, um, lasers, for example. We've got alcohol cleaning solutions. We've got anesthetic gases. We've got patient drapes. We've got dressings. We've got swabs. We've got even things like the patient's hair, intestinal gases. All these, these things are, are um, problematic. As we said in our, in our earlier research, we spoke about those three incidents that they already had, a total of six from fire and burning, um, and this can be extremely problematic. So we know about the World Health Organization Surgical Safety Checklist. Um, in my research, I came across this really nice video. It may seem a little over the top, um, but I think it's the right thing to do. So this is here where the staff were performing the World Health uh, Organization Surgical Safety Checklist with emphasis on fire prevention because of the nature of the case that they were about to do. Um, you can hear that it looks quite genuine because they were all quite nervous. Um, but quite an interesting video to watch, and it should be something we should be looking at and we should really, really be doing correctly. All right, we're ready for our timeout. Can we have the music off, please? Sure. Okay, let's introduce each other. Uh, Gary Venkatraman, surgeon. Cam Clark, anesthesia. Kelly Carey, circuit scrub nurse. Pat, Stockwell, circulator. This is Mr. Jeff Smith. Uh, he's here for a tonsillectomy. Was he identified when he came in? He was. He was. Yes. Uh, he's been positioned. Uh, site marking is not needed because this is a bilateral intraoral procedure. Uh, hopefully, blood won't be needed. Does he have any allergies? He does not. He does not. Uh, were anti uh, antibiotic start time? Um, he's not ordered for any and so has no antibiotic start time. Uh, are venodynes on and running? Yep. The machine is turned on. Uh, imaging is not needed. Pathology studies are not needed. Uh, do we have medications on the field? Yes, I have 1% lidocaine with epi, 1 to 200,000, 30 mLs. Expiration is 313. Uh, Thank you. He is a full code. Uh, is that agreed? Correct. Yes. Uh, any anesthesia or adequate concerns? Um, no concerns. He's an otherwise healthy person, easy airway, other than the risk of fire, which I think we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, since this is a high fire case, because we're going to have cauterate near a high oxygen source, if there is a fire, I will pull the intracranial tube out. If the fire is on the on the drapes, I will pull those off as well. I have a wet towel soaked in normal saline, as well as a container of normal saline with a bulb syringe that I would extinguish the fire with. I will run his oxygen concentration as close to room air as is possible. I will use no nitrous oxide, and then the event of a fire will assist in extinguishing the fire and managing the airway. And there's a fire extinguisher in the room. Okay, do we have our final team okay? Uh, you want to just verify the code status for the patient? He is a full code. Full code. Yes. I'm all set. Great. Thank you. That was a very, very thorough of the surgical uh, process of the surgical safety checklist. Very well done. Um, and as you could see, with fire in mind, with all of the preventative measures in place before they begin surgery. Really good example of preventative uh, maintenance, as it were. Right, what about uh, CSSD? So again, back to our occupational or handbook of occupational hazards and controls for staff in the CSSD. This actually came from, um, from Canada. Uh, there is great potential for things like fryer and projectiles or physical injury from compressed gas cylinders. And we use a whole variety of these things in our environment. So very important that everything we use is installed correctly and managed correctly. Um, and that we've been trained accordingly in handling all of these cylinders and items that could be um, in our environment. 
electrical hazards arising from electrical cords and appliances. There are a multitude of uh, electrical appliances, both in the operating room and in the CCSD environment. Uh, so very important to check the electrical cords for all of our devices. If everything, anything is worn or frayed or looking dodgy, please, please, please report it and please make sure that it's repaired or replaced um, as soon as possible. You know, I often see um, a dodgy radio in the corner sometimes in the CCSD and, and the electrical cable is, is, is threaded through a whole bunch of things that are good ignition sources. Please be cautious and look out for all of these things in both the CCSD and the operating room. Of course, specific to CCSD, burns from handling recently um, sterilized equipment. Um, how we open and load and unload and manage our autoclaves becomes very, very important. The importance of using um, heat resistant gloves, of course, and protective clothing. Not only that, we also need to make sure that everybody is correctly um, trained in all of these matters. And of course, that we know what is happening with our devices. Moving on to a very, very, very sad event that I, I came across. Um, I found this uh, in a LinkedIn feed that I follow, and it was about a serious fatal incident where a CCT worker died. Um, this autoclave exploded, as you can see from all the blood and bits on the corner over there. Um, somebody was seriously injured. Uh, it wasn't in, in English, so with Google Translate, I tried to understand the best I could from the news headlines. Um, but the, the ultimate uh, end result was this person who died on scene at site at work when the autoclave exploded. These devices we use are, are, uh, are high risk, they are hazardous. It is so important that we follow the instructions for use and that we have sufficient training uh, in, in using all of our devices and of course that we maintain them, that we make sure that they get their regular maintenance, all the pieces of equipment that we own in our CCC because we really don't want somebody dying from an explosion. Right, also theatre table safety, another area or aspect of concern to us. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with this report. It's called the ECRI report. It comes out every year. And in this ECRI uh, highlight incidences that have been reported to them, it's American based, um, but it is quite relevant, of course. Um, and, and they list the top 10 hazards for that particular year. And in the last couple of years, one of the things that have come to the front is cleaning fluids seeping into the electrical components, leading to equipment damages and fire. So another reason to be very careful in the operating room when you're cleaning um, afterwards uh, between cases or whatever, damp dusting or cleaning your tables, please be very careful. Of course, very important that the floor locks are engaged on your table at any time when there is a patient on the table, otherwise we could have huge risk um, to the patient. And then not to store items on the base of the table. Now, this has two um, consequences to it. One, of course, is damage to the equipment itself, cost of fortune to re replace and repair these columns and these column covers. Um, maybe you can look at trying to see if they're column covers uh, or additional things that you can do to protect the, the base of the table. Maybe you can also look at um, devices or places to store these things correctly. But please, wherever possible, do not use the base of the table to store equipment. Not only are you going to get table damage, but of course, if something uh, catches while you're busy uh, lifting or, or dropping the table, there's a chance that the tabletop moves and the patient is then put at risk for injury as well. So it's a twofold issue. I know we want we might want the, the bear hugger quite close or the warming device quite close, but putting it on the base of the table is not safe. But, and then another important aspect to think about is surgical plumes. I was very glad that the uh, at the APSA Congress this year, they focused on surgical plume. We had an international uh, person uh, present uh, um, using a hybrid system, which was really well done. Uh, but there are numerous published papers and guidelines on managing surgical plume. We've seen publications from the Australian College of, uh, of Perioperative Nurses, from the AORM in the USA, from the AFPP, which is the UK group, from the European Operating Room Nurses Association, and also papers published in, for example, the Journal of Cancer. 
talking all about the awareness around surgical smoke hazards and what we can do to prevent them or manage them, should I say. So we'll just look at some points now uh, from this particular published paper from 2023 titled Surgical Plume and its Associated Hazards for Perioperative Staff, a Review of Current Standards for Practice and Risk Management. Right, so surgical plume will pose a risk, of course, to all of us in the operating room, the entire team, the nurses, the patients, um, and of course, the, uh, the surgeon. When electrical surgical device is used, it causes the rupture of the cellular membranes and it releases vaporized intracellular contents into the air. The plume can comprise of all sorts of things, including cellular debris. That debris can include carcinogens, toxins, blood, bacteria, viruses, and tissue particles, and they're all aerolized, and we can then inhale them. The particles of plume range in size from 0.01 microns up to 200 microns. And of course, particles less than 0.3 microns in size can pass by the lung's normal filtration system and reach your bronchioles and your alveola. Quite a problem. So what can we do to prevent this? and we need to find ways to manage it. So the ARN talks about uh, this uh, hierarchy of controls. Uh, what can we try to do to manage surgical plume? Well, of course, the first thing is, can you eliminate the hazard? Um, no, not necessarily, because we obviously need to use diathermy during our, our surgical procedure. Is there a substitution? Are there any alternative energy devices that one can use that generate less smoke? Not necessarily an easy decision and one that, that the surgeon has to take. What engineering controls can we put into place so that we can prevent exposure? And that, of course, is going to also, the HVAC becomes important in here. Um, and are there any uh, devices we can use to, to help remove um, surgical plume? What administrative controls can we can we put into place? So policies that we can pull it to place, and of course then using PPE or even, uh, for example, using filters if you are if you have a laparoscopic system and um, that's CO2 uh, that's released. Uh, even that, you know, we you've been using diathermy intraoperatively that comes up with a combination of CO2 and surgical plume, maybe attaching a filter on the end of that can also help both the equipment and, of course, your staff themselves. Yes, wearing um, N95 masks can help a little bit, but it won't help with absolutely everything because that's um, N95 masks are not about particles as such, more uh, microorganisms. Of course, another well-known hazard in our world are shops. Shops sometimes end up in trolleys and and, um, and down to the CSSD, that's problematic. The uh, Occupational Health Act, of course, it says don't put your fellow colleagues at risk. So making sure we manage our shops and the operating room is very important. Are we able to eliminate hazards? For example, can we use skin staplers instead of suture needles? Well, that's up to our surgeon. Um, are there some engineering controls, maybe some form of self-retracting needle or something that we could use? Is that an option available to us? What work practices or administrative controls can we put into place, like uh, Hep B, hands-free techniques, very important, and something where I try and teach this to, um, to some of our TICS uh, surgical students uh, to keep us safe, the importance of hands-free um, uh, passing techniques, and of course, um, continuous training. PPE, well, there's not too much PPE that protects you from a sharp injury, unfortunately, but um, hopefully rather eliminate as much of the risk as possible. When it comes to surgical blades, very important, of course, how we handle them prior to use, because that's what's going to affect its performance during use. To manage the keenness of the cutting edge, so how well it cuts, very important when you open your blades, of course, that it doesn't make contact with metal. So don't open blades into receivers or into uh, into your bowls. Important to open them rather on a soft surface because otherwise you can make them blunt. When we're attaching the blade, how we attach it matters. Don't grip if you, some people will use a hand technique, some people will use an instrument to load on with. Um, if you're using an instrument, make sure you do not um, impede the edge, the cutting edge, with the instrument that you are using. During use, um, any cutting of really hard granular tissue or uh, rubbing up against bone, of course, will also affect the sharpness. 
and excessive lateral pressure. So leaning to the one side a little bit while cutting, not having a nice 90 degree angle to the skin can also create loss of keenness. Alrighty, so we've covered quite a lot now in the last two um, sessions. And the last one that we want to focus on now is um, psychological stress. So we just got one slide to cover around that. I haven't dealt with the impact of aging and I haven't dealt too much with shift work. Those are perhaps topics we can look into next year. In fact, when I did the research for this, I came across so many published papers that I've only included a very small percent of it um, in this in this series. So maybe we can do another safety series again next year, looking at the other stuff that I haven't covered yet. But of course, impact of aging very important for all of us um, when there is so much physical workload in our environments, both in the CSSD and the operating. Uh, one that we all know very well is abuse, abuse by co-workers. So abuse can uh, can be from, from theatre onto CSSD, from CSSD <clears throat> within CSSD, from uh, our surgeons to our theatre staff, from our theatre matrons to our theatre staff, from the theatre staff to the floor nurse, and so it goes on. And unfortunately, we all um, are, are well known for being aggressive. I guess is the right word. And in some environments, it's all seen as a norm, but of course it shouldn't be. Very important that we enforce policies that indica in, indicate no tolerance for any form of violence, harassment or abuse, including bullying. Uh, as a theatre scrub sister and as a matron, of course, I've been subjected to all sorts of things. I've had surgical blades thrown at me and my whole um, irrigation system tossed in my direction, as sometimes our surgeons do. Um, but things that we need to manage and I was always very grateful when our management stepped up and dealt with these matters. Techno stresses, because we are introducing new technology all of the time, something that we really and truly need to, to think about, um, making sure that everybody has sufficient training, that there are backup plans in place if there are any failures, and that we've got realistic expectations. So, of course, everybody's putting into place new um, digital platforms and new ways of doing things, and it takes time for everybody to learn about these things and get comfortable with all of these devices. So very important that we get um, uh, time to, to, to learn and understand and, and get to know all of these things. Another important thing that can also induce stress, by the way, they refer to in this handbook, is air quality. And of course, proper ventilation is going to be important in the theatre for and the CCT for an infection control point of view, but also related to our own stresses. Very important that our ventilation systems work well. Some CSSTs have got no air conditioning whatsoever or poor air conditioning and they're just so hot in there and noisy and can be a very awkward and difficult environment for us to work in. Alrighty, so bearing in mind our time constraints in this webinar series, we've discussed a multitude of risks and hazards that can threaten the safety of our patients and our healthcare workers, both in the operating room and from CCT perspective. We focused on chemical hazards, biological hazards, the issues relating to ergonomics, and of course, psychological hazards. I've not covered retained surgical items because I think that could be something we can do in a whole separate webinar series. It was just so much to cover around that. We could definitely do a whole webinar dedicated to shops management with some interesting publications that talks to um, uh, when uh, these risks tend to occur most. Uh, that will help guide us around um, how to protect ourselves. Hopefully in this series, I've provided food for thought and maybe listed some possible solutions for some risks that you may not have thought of um, recently. Thank you so much uh, once again for joining us. Apologies for last week's link, but we will be sending it out, not to stress, um, in the near future. Again, we'll send out the links to a recording of both sessions of today's session as well, as well as the links to the tests. I hope you um, enjoyed today's session. And, and leave here going to look in your departments, all of the areas to look at where your risks are and think about ways of managing your hazards. Thank you so much.